All right, welcome to the 2016 March APS meeting uh, press conference series. This is the first of our press conferences for today. We have uh, two more later today and then several for the rest of the week, so uh, please tune in for those as well. This is uh, specifically, this press conference is um, relating to the uh, LGBT climate in, in physics report. Uh, I'm very proud of the APS for tackling this issue with uh, such, uh, such dedication. So I'm just going to introduce first the, um, the, uh, one of the uh, liaisons to the, to the committee. This is uh, uh, Arlene Modeste Knowles, the Diversity Program Administrator that, at the American Physical Society. She works on programs aimed at broadening the participation of diverse and underrepresented groups in physics. From the beginning, she has worked with the LGBT plus physics group to provide networking opportunities at APS meetings, help to facil excuse me, facilitate the development of the APS ad hoc committee on LGBT issues, and serves as one of the staff liaisons to the committee. I'm going to let, turn this over to Arlene so that she can introduce the speakers, and then we will um, commence with a uh, press conference. Here. All right, thank you, everyone. So I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, who are on the committee. Uh, first, I want to introduce Dr. Michael Falk. Michael Falk is professor uh, at Johns Hopkins University who deploys computational methods to develop physical theories of non-equilibrium processes in materials. He is chairperson of the APS Ad Hoc Committee on LGBT Issues and has played a major role in coordinating the writing of the LGBT report. Michael has served as member at large for the Group on Statistical and Nonlinear Physics and was a recipient of the APS Nicholas Metropolis Award for Outstanding Doctoral Thesis Work in Computational Physics. He also leads an NSF-funded math and science partnership with Baltimore City Schools called STEM Achievement in Baltimore Elementary Schools. That's Dr. Michael Falk. Dr. Elena Long is a postdoctoral research associate at the University of New Hampshire, where she studies experimental hadronic physics with an emphasis on nucleonic spin structure. She's also the founder of the organization LGBT Plus Physicist, is an active member of the APS Ad Hoc Committee on LGBT Issues, and is Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion for OSTEM, which is out in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Dr. Ramon Bethelemy is a social science researcher who focuses his work on equity in physics. Dr. Bartholomew is currently a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow and former Fulbright in Finland. He completed his bachelor's degree in astrophysics before earning a PhD in physics education. As part of the APS Ad Hoc Committee on LGBT Issues, Dr. Bartholomew led the design, implementation, and analysis of the survey and subsequent interviews used in the report. Dr. Monica Plisch is Associate Director of Education and Diversity for the American Physical Society and is one of the staff liaisons to the Committee on LGBT Issues. She's also engaged in other efforts to promote diversity and inclusion in the physics community. Monica leads the Physics Teacher Education Coalition called FizTech, uh, FizTech Project, which has a mission to improve the education of future physics teachers. And before coming to APS, Monica led nanoscience education initiatives at Cornell University, where she also completed her doctoral studies in physics. Dr. Savannah Garman is an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Sciences at Osaka Prefecture University. She was one of several physicists who helped launch the grassroots LGBT plus physicist diversity organization and has spoken about her experiences as a transgender woman in physics. Savannah completed her doctoral studies in physics at UT Austin in 2007. Her research interests include open quantum systems and non-Hermitian physics with applications in condensed matter and quantum optics. And I also just want to acknowledge some other committee uh, members in the audience, which would be Tim Atherton, who's a professor of physics at Tufts University, Kyle Reeves, who is a graduate student at the UNC Chapel Hill, and Dr. Wooter DeConnick, who's a professor of physics at College of William and Mary. So I will turn this over to Michael. I have one, uh, but maybe we need to be able to pass that. Thanks. Thanks, Arlene, and thank you, everybody, for coming for the press conference. Um, I just want to, before I start, acknowledge that this committee report was 18 months of very hard work, and I want to thank my fellow committee members for all the dedication they put in to put the report together. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about 
what the report is, how it came to be, and what our main findings are and recommendations. Um, so the committee, the committee came together at the request of Kate Kirby, who's in the room, thank you for coming, uh, the executive officer of the APS, who asked that we convene for 18 months on a limited term basis to assess what the climate is for LGBT, LGBT people within physics. Um, and to inform APS as to what concrete steps APS could take to increase the inclusivity within our community. Um, so we undertook several different activities in order to gather data for this report. Uh, one of these was uh, gatherings, focus groups held at meetings just like the one we're at today at the March meeting, at the April meeting, um, to inquire amongst our colleagues what, what is the climate they're experiencing, what, what are they seeing out in, out in the universities, the labs, the workplaces where they practice physics every day. Uh, we also undertook a climate survey. This was led by Ramon Barthelemy, uh, where we uh, sent out a snowball survey. So basically, we asked people to distribute the survey to others like them who could provide input. Um, we were able to receive over 300 responses to that survey. Um, and then Ramon conducted follow-up interviews with five of the survey participants to get more in-depth qualitative data about what is going on in our community. Um, you can see here we, we list some of the, the demographics of the population, um, which was, uh, as you see on the screen. Uh, in addition, we worked with the membership committee at APS um, in order to introduce one additional demographic question into the membership survey that was distributed to APS members, which was responded to by over 2,500 APS members. Um, and that gave us some idea of what the demographics were within the community. I just want to point out one very interesting statistic that, became, uh, that came out of that survey question, which was that whereas 2.5% uh, of the APS respondents identified as LGBT, 14% uh, preferred not to provide this information, uh, which I think is significant. And in addition, in the youngest demographic, in the 18 to 25 year old demographic, about one in six identified as LGBT. So why there seems to be such a drop off in people's willingness to respond to this question and um, people's uh, identity as LGBT in such a survey is, is an interesting question to ask. I'm not sure we have all the answers to that question, but I'll try to give some indications as to why that might be. Okay, so our first finding uh, that came from our uh, investigation was an assessment of how people in physics felt, perceived the um, policies and legislation surrounding their, um, their position. And so as you'll see, um, within the greater LGBT community, only about 50% could characterize the policies in place at their workplace or university as supportive or highly supportive. Um, and amongst trans respondents, this number was even lower. And I think it's important to acknowledge that we live in a country now where there are no uh, national protections, employment protections for LGBT people. Um, but in addition, there are other things at stake, especially when you think beyond the United States. Many APS members come from around the world, and there are other countries, uh, such as in India, where Section 377 still criminalizes homosexual behavior, and in Russia, where uh, gay propaganda is against the law, where the situation is even more dire. Um, even within states in the U.S. right now, there are legislative actions being contemplated, in this case, to limit transgender people's access to restrooms. So the situation is very uneven from country to country, from state to state, from university to university, and I think that's one of the pictures that has really become clear in looking at the, the data. Um, furthermore, we tried to assess the climate experienced by LGBT people. And again, I think it's important to realize that this is very uneven, that it depends on which university you're at, at which lab you happen to be working in. And it also depends very sensitively on your identity, whether you're a man, you're a woman, whether you're gender nonconforming, whether you're a trans person. Um, in particular, as you'll see from the data on the screen, the level of discomfort amongst LGBT women was significantly higher than that of LGBT men, and gender nonconforming people even higher. And that extended to um, observ observations and experience of harassment, 
which was also higher for LGBT women and gender nonconforming people than for <coughs> LGBT men. Um, another pervasive aspect in the data was the sense that amongst at least some fraction of LGBT physicists, there is a perception uh, that they do better to be closeted in their workplace or university. So you see, when asked directly whether they agreed or disagreed with the statement, is there pressure for LGBT employees to stay? About 20, more than 25%, about 30% um, indicated that they agreed or strongly agreed with the statement. Um, and then the um, testimonial from particular people uh, assessing why that might be the case for them, which included a sense of being excluded from routine social interactions, but also pro joint proposal, uh, writing activities, and um, things of that nature. In addition, many LGBT physicists we talked to, particularly students, uh, described a sense of isolation. Um, and we think that that's also a pervasive aspect of, uh, for many LGBT people in the physics community. Um, exclusionary behavior is a, a way that we use to describe a sort of class of different um, acts that LGBT people could experience in the workplace that really ranged all the way from harassment that could be verbal or physical sexual harassment to exclusion or shunning. Um, and we asked LGBT respondents to the climate survey to, to assess whether they had observed such behavior and whether they had experienced such behavior. So here you'll see that, again, we see uh, systematic differences between LGBT men, for whom this was about 10% reported observing such or experiencing such uh, exclusionary behavior. It was about three times higher for LGBT women, and even higher than that for gender nonconforming people. Um, excuse me. So uh, the people who experienced perhaps the most problematic climates uh, of those who we uh, obtained responses from were those who held multiple marginalized identities. So, and I think you, you already see that in the data I've showed you so far, people who are LGBT and women uh, show a shockingly high level of discomfort and, and experience of harassment. But that was true also for people of color who identified as LGBT. Um, and in fact, for these respondents, when we asked them in freeform questions, about the situations they found themselves in, it became clear that they often had trouble distinguishing why they were experiencing or what the motivated the exclusionary behavior to which they were being exposed, whether it arose from their uh, racial identity, their sexual identity, their gender. Um, it's often difficult to tell. Um, of the people surveyed, trans people faced some of the most hostile climates within our community of any of the subgroups that we uh, interviewed. Um, so you can see that here, 60% of trans respondents had observed some kind of exclusionary behavior, and a, about 50% had experienced some kind of uh, exclusionary behavior during their time in physics. And that could have included things like being misgendered on a routine basis, which can be extremely mentally debilitating, um, or being uh, questioned when using their gender-appropriate restroom. Uh, one additional aspect of this is that of the LGBT physicists we surveyed, 36%, which is a shockingly high number, I think, um, had reported that within the past year they had considered leaving their school or their uh, place of employment. Um, and we saw that this correlated highly with observing exclusionary behavior. So, uh, and so it didn't necessarily have to be a direct experience of exclusionary behavior, but just observing others being exposed to such exclusionary behavior uh, contributed to this. Um, and there are some quotes provided for people describing uh, these sorts of decisions. Uh, one of the things that uh, marked the LGBT experience within physics, uh, as I had said before, was a sense of isolation. And I think our last finding was around the need for allies, that LGBT people uh, who described a positive workplace often described um, ways of finding allies who maybe may or may not have been other LGBT people, people who were willing to take it upon themselves to be a mentor, be a guide, stand with them if they experienced any sort of 
uh, exclusion. Um, and so finding such people within your institution is uh, sometimes helped by things like safe zone programs that universities or, or companies uh, hold. This is a safe zone symbol from Johns Hopkins where I happen to work. So I'll just quickly run through the recommendations uh, that spring from these findings. So these include um, focusing on things like this meeting that we're at today, the APS meetings, and making sure that these meetings are themselves welcoming and open places where people don't experience harassment. And I think APS has taken an important step in this direction by uh, having a code of conduct now clearly articulated. Um, but the committee also wanted to make sure that APS follows through with very clear uh, procedures and guidelines for how violations of this code of conduct will be uh, handled. Uh, we also feel that one of the pervasive aspects of being a physicist is publication of research results. And um, publication of research results can become uh, particularly problematic for trans individuals who change their name uh, perhaps during a gender transition. And um, having working as one of the largest physics publishers in the country and the world to help address these kinds of issues, particularly now that we have uh, electronic identifiers and such things that can really help us address these issues in ways that couldn't have been imagined five or ten years ago uh, was one concern. Um, we feel that APS has the capacity to develop advocacy efforts uh, that support LGBT equity and inclusion within our community. Uh, this includes promoting LGBT inclusive practices both in academia and in laboratories. That there are many people out there who may want to be allies but maybe don't have the resources or access to information to be effective in their workplace. And so providing um, you know, established goals for inclusion that uh, different universities or labs can adopt would be very helpful. Um, APS is also a leader in providing mentorship in our field to young people. And we feel it's important that APS acknowledge that within those mentorship programs, there are some subset of physicists who are LGBT and that there should be intentional thinking as to how we um, address their needs as well. And then finally, um, one of the big questions for us was whether LGBT people need uh, something along the lines of the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics or the Committee on Minorities who for uh, many years now have provided leadership in addressing uh, diversity issues within physics. Um, but we feel that because many LGBT people share uh, identities between these different uh, minoritized categories, that it would be very helpful to instead direct our efforts to forming a forum on diversity and inclusion that was membership-led and that included concerns across many different um, identities and, and issues within uh, inclusion in physics. So I think that's all I have for today. So uh, thank you very much for attending, and we're happy to take uh, questions as a panel. Um, we'll answer them as we feel our expertise uh, directs us. So, thank you. Uh, I do want to point out that copies, hard copies of the report are available in the room for people in the room. If you uh, are uh, online viewing this through the webcast, we can provide uh, copies through uh, email. Uh, so we have some questions over here. Okay. Uh, Mitch Waldrop uh, with Nature Magazine. Um, when I was uh, researching an article I wrote on LGBT uh, scientists, uh, one of the things that was uh, pointed out, and I was wondering to what extent your uh, recommendations address this, um, that for students in like the secondary years before they get to college, um, I mean every adolescent goes through turmoil, they're going through special turmoil and the implication seemed to be that they might not be going into the hard sciences simply because they didn't have, um, it, was, it was just too hard giving everything else that was going on into their life. Um, nobody could say for sure because nobody was collecting the data uh, enough to say it. Uh, to what extent are you addressing uh, students in uh, the before uh, college years? I think there are many interesting aspects to that question. Do people want, so one, one thing I would like to address maybe before we jump into the specific question about um, students is the data question. Because that was really pervasive for our 
um, undertaking this work was the lack of data. I mean, we found ourselves in a room asking, well, how many of us are there? Are we underrepresented? You know, we don't even know that. You know, because nobody takes data on LGBT populations within STEM. The census certainly doesn't. Yeah, the census doesn't, and our, and it's, and our, uh, like, National Science Foundation doesn't necessarily, hasn't been so proactive at encouraging those, that kind of data taking. So I think that's one priority we have for addressing those issues is to just assess what is the situation. In many cases, we don't know. Does anybody want to specifically address the... Um, particularly for addressing the issue with um, K through 12 students, within our uh, recommendations, one of the things that the APS does is make a number of statements um, that it uses to influence how it interacts with a number of different um, fields. And a number of those statements directly address uh, people within the K through 12 community. So we've gone through the entire list of statements, and um, for all of them, including uh, for K through 12. Uh, we included recommendations of how to better include language for that. So as the APS moves forward in general with K-12 uh, through education and outreach efforts, that that's not something that's lost. That's something that we make sure that the APS has moving forward. In general, the um, organization that most studies this population is GLSEN, the Gay and Lesbian Student Education Network. Um, they've been doing absolutely fantastic work at the K-12 through level, but as far as I know, I. I don't know of any um, statistics within them that specifically look at the STEM fields. Hi, Mateen Durrani from Physics World magazine. This is a topic we looked at in our current issue. Um, and you mentioned that there's quite a bit of variability from government to government and state to state and university to university. Are there any really good examples of employers that are doing a really good job that one could showcase to other institutions? <laughs> I'm not sure we looked at things to that level of granularity in our particular assessment. And in particular, we weren't, um, we weren't assessing places company by company. I would say that one of the practices that APS engages in that we think is very um, helpful is that Committee on Minorities and Committee on the Status of Women in Physics will go to departments or laboratories on an as-requested basis to um, assess the climate for their minority and women employees uh, in physics, you know, heavy uh, departments and institutions. And so one of our recommendations is that uh, LGBT inclusion should be included in those sorts of assessments in, in a systematic way. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, I, I think our, our, our purpose here isn't necessarily to rank, uh, to provide a ranking, uh, but to provide the resources so places can, can make themselves more inclusive. Do we have any questions online? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul Grant here. I'm a freelance science writer. I uh, publish uh, book reviews and commentaries in uh, physics world and, and nature. I'm just curious, um, have you coordinated your studies and techniques, survey techniques, with other professional societies like the American Chemical Society and the IEEE? So we designed this survey from the ground up using resources, looking at best practices for survey items, looking at climate issues and LGBT populations more broadly. So we used some stuff out of literature looking at higher ed, used some stuff out of literature looking at workplace climates, but we did not coordinate with other member societies. I think that's a clever thing to do in the future because we can actually compare exact um, metrics across different organizations, but it's not something we really had the resources to do this time around. Do you anticipate uh, follow-up studies on an annual basis or any schedule at all? The charge of this committee only lasted 18 months, so currently we have no plans to relaunch a climate study, but we have all of the infrastructure in place that if we wanted to, it would be a possibility, or if someone wanted to pick this work up after us, that would also be a possibility. And were, were there any indications in the data that you received that there were outstanding questions that you should have asked this time, that you might ask next time, something that has arisen since you analyzed the data? I would say one of the blind spots in our survey was a statistical look at issues of race 
So in order to look at that issue, what we did is we recruited a number of participants to actually talk to them and interview them about their experiences. But one of our concerns was uh, that maybe we didn't reach this population of people, or it might be that they don't necessarily exist within the physics community, which is also a huge problem. So I think that we need to think more seriously about those intersections, which goes right down to the earlier question about K-12, which is a lot of students might not be having access to physics education earlier in their careers. We need to be thinking about them. But of course, trying to get into the K-12 schools to do research is very tricky because of all the um, review board processes. And also one of the problems at the K-12 level is oftentimes the issues and the bullies are actually in the home and not necessarily in the school, though they're there too. One other thing with that too that was um, mentioned and uh, brought up during the talk was uh, the demographic question that was included on the APS membership survey. Um, that saw far greater numbers of people roughly in the age of undergraduates than at any other point in their career. And if you break it down um, further, this wasn't included on the slide, but it drops uh, from that down, I think, to about 9% for graduate students, about graduate student age, because it was broken down by age, to about 3% for postdoc age, and then faculty age kind of roughed out about 1%. Um, so there's this dramatic drop off from uh, the career stages from undergraduate to faculty. Um, that we don't entirely understand what's going on there. There are a number of different issues that could be. It could be that younger people are more open about identifying. It could be an effect of a leaky pipeline, similar to what we see for women in physics. Um, but we don't know. And that was something in the data that, uh, within the report, we do make mention that that's something that um, anything should be looked into uh, more forward, uh, more in depth moving forward. I think it's also worth mentioning one of the things Else had brought up looking at the data was whether one of the reasons we see such a low population my age and above was the large number of, of LGBT people we lost to AIDS. So this is also possible. Um, Mitch Waldrop at Nature uh, again. Um, uh, getting back to data, the, uh, the survey you did was self-selected out of necessity, I'm sure. But that has all the problems you would expect. Uh, is there any intention or any idea of how you'd go about doing this more systematically? Is that even possible? There are a lot of limitations when you're focusing on a population whose known identity might cause harm to their career, um, who are hard to reach, and who aren't organized. So within those limitations, the best the best methodology we had was to create the instrument and send it out to folks that we could identify and then ask them to send it out to others who might not want to identify as a list server that we might not know about so that they could actually take it in an anonymous and safe way. That being said, I still think it's possible that a lot of people may not have taken it just because they did fear that their anonymity wouldn't be protected even though we guaranteed it through a bunch of different measures. Within these limitations, there's only certain things that we can do and we work to the best of our ability within them. To reach LGBT physicists more broadly, events like this are what are powerful because just by having it on the, the report available and also by having it on the schedule, people know that we're actually doing this work and can look for it in the future. But we do have to look towards the community to distribute these things and also to come forward to share their experiences. I'd say the, the also, just to add to that, the membership survey was not um, self-selected. That was uh, a sample, a random sample of APS members. So, and uh, one of the interesting things was the number, the fraction, the high fraction of uh, APS members who, ch who would not provide the information. So this is another obvious complication for getting reasonable data going forward. The other unfortunate thing was there were about 1% of the respondents, about 20 respondents who took offense to the question. So um, that's also somehow telling. Yeah, if I might add on to that, Michael, um, one of the frequently the one of the negative comments types of comments that we received in the membership survey was, you know, what does this have to do with physics? Um, and that's I think that's an attitude that sometimes um, gets reflected a little bit more broadly. And like sometimes the physics is so exciting, we we forget that it's the people who do physics, and um, you know, people are at their best when they're welcomed when they feel safe and supported um, and so I think 
this report is really kind of gets at the essence of what we should be caring about as a professional society is not only looking after the physics, but looking after the physicists. We have a question online here. Hold on just a second. Actually, a couple questions. <laughs> so the first one is, did international, so non-American or non-U.S. based survey respondents display any trends that were distinct from U.S. based respondents? So did you get that? There were no statistically significant differences in the data between folks international and also in the U.S., but this sort of goes back to the question of who took the survey again, because in the places where LGBT people are most threatened and most endangered, they might be so closeted or not out that the survey never got to them, or in such fear because the repercussions are so extreme that they didn't take it. So that is, again, a limitation of the work we're doing, but it's a uh, nature of the course. Okay, and next question. <laughs> so it said Asian and South Asian were separated from each other. Uh, was that based on survey design or respondent choices? And what does Asian represent? So uh, we designed the survey to have as inclusive amount of options possible to identify your uh, racial identity and also your country of origin. So that was designed by us. We did not define the word Asian, so the word Asian would have had to been defined by the person who was taking the instrument. Okay. And then the last question from online is, you know, it says, physics is often characterized as having a particularly tough climate for women as compared to other fields, even within the sciences. Um, so she's wondering, is there a similar sense for LGBT issues? So physics versus other fields. So we don't have data to concretely say with statistical tests whether or not this is true. But when we look at the literature of how gender minorities are treated in physics, I think that there's good evidence to support that claim. Because when you look at physics, it's sort of this overt rational, this overt objectivity. We have a culture that's bedrock in the idea that we are a culture of no culture. But in fact, we do have a very rich culture. But when we have a community that believes we don't have a culture, the bigotries and the discriminations and the other isms are dug deep. And they're difficult to remove and they're entrenched because we don't think that there's a problem. So one of the key issues in the physics community is we first have to admit that we have issues within our own community that we need to address, which is very similar to what Monica spoke of earlier, which is a number of the participants uh, said that we shouldn't even be asking this question. And that in and of itself is a problem. I mean, I, I also think the data does paint a picture that, um, you know, LGBT men, gay men, fa faced some discrimination in physics, but women and gender nonconforming people and trans people face a much higher barrier, right? And I think that tells us something that a lot of the discrimination is, in some sense, gender motivated. Like, there is, there is a gendered aspect to the discrimination. Questions? But it currently it's an ad hoc committee. Is there any issues, any uh, plans for it to become a standing committee with the American Physical Society? This. Um, well, so recommendation six that Michael shared with us is to to carry on the work that the committee has begun um, through creating a membership based forum on diversity and inclusion. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, interest and energy and support for doing this. Um, we've already reached out to the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics, the Committee on Minorities, um, and there's a lot, of, um, a lot of interest in making this happen. Any more questions? And I, I think it's worth emphasizing when it comes to the, the forum on diversity and inclusion that what that does is that, uh, that uh, hopefully uh, offers a natural uh, mechanism or structure for addressing some of these intersectional issues that, that keep coming up. Um, that people who were LGBT, people of color, couldn't exactly discern where the harassment or exclusionary behavior uh, originated necessarily, or the fact that uh, women, uh, LGBT women, uh, faced uh, much greater problems than LGBT men on the whole.
Hi, um, thanks. Um, so it's really heartbreaking to hear about um, the hostile environment that seems quite prevalent in uh, the univer uh, some universities uh, within the U.S. Um, is the APS going to be making any kinds of efforts to assist people who are in these kinds of positions, either through lobbying the universities that you've become aware of through the survey, or um, maybe perhaps having a more discreet traveling roadshow that will go around to educate both the university on what they should be doing to make a more inclusive environment, and then how um, people who are facing such discrimination can legally assist themselves in preventing this from happening at the university? So, I mean, I think just issuing this report is sort of a, at least one step in this direction. As part of this report issue, the report will be sent to physics departments around the country. That packet will include um, posters that people can, department heads or people within a department who are concerned can post around their department to raise awareness of the issue. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, APS isn't, you know, physics isn't a top-down enterprise. <laughs> it's very much, you know, uh, an amalgamation of people who love learning and love discovering things about the universe coming together to work toward a common cause. And so I think if things are going to change, they're going to change because physicists themselves on the grassroots level are empowered to... Um, make sure that their department, that their unit, that their lab is a welcoming place. And I think that's more the role that APS has to play than, than swooping in um, and changing an organization. Um, and that's what we're hoping to empower APS to do. Yeah, and I'll just add on to what Michael said. And a couple of the specific recommendations in the report um, call out um, developing a, uh, an educational effort aimed at allies because one of the quotes that really spoke to me was, um, you know, somebody wrote, you know, it's like, it's that the support for LGBT physicists isn't visible. It's not that it's not there. It's just it's not very visible. And when it's not visible, um, it's, not, it's not as helpful as it could be. Um, so um, having some sort of an educational effort aimed at allies and those who want to be allies. Um, but in addition to that, um, another particular specific recommendation was around uh, looking into establishing a network for LGBT physicists um, that, you know, I think sim the, the formation of LGBT plus physicist group that uh, Elena started was really instrumental, I think, in, in for the first time really bringing together a larger group of LGBT physicists. And just that alone can really help with uh, addressing some of the issues and getting information from other LGBT physicists can be really useful. Um, I think another idea that's relevant here um, when, it when it comes to uh, changing culture at individual departments, uh, at individual institutions, another idea that, that has, has come up in our discussions is um, that uh, students and postdocs, and postdocs tend to be particularly vulnerable in some ways, it seems like, uh, because they're kind of... Uh, at a new institution, they're not there for very long, and they're constantly already applying for other jobs, and they've got, they've got a lot on their plate already. Um, but one idea that, that's important that came up is um, having an alternative mentor, having someone in the, in the structure of how it's set up that there's, someone, there's always someone else for them to talk to if they're having trouble with their formal mentor, um, that there's always... A, that there's always uh, an alternative pipeline somewhere in the process. Um, and I think that, that's, one, that's one idea of how individual departments can, can start addressing uh, climate change in their institutions. Okay, so two more online questions. The first is, how likely do you think APS is to accept your recommendations? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, yeah, uh, oh, did you want to, do you have a... I have no prognostication, so if you do, Monica. <laughs> I was just going to say, so um, Kate Kirby is here. Um, we're very grateful that um, she's here. So she may want to speak to that. But I'll just say that we've already had um, conversations with a number of um, APS staff members who, um, who are, are leading in various areas with regard to meetings, publication, advocacy, programs. 
um, that sort of thing. And I'll, I'm actually really pleased to say that a number of the recommendations have already been adopted um, or in the process of being adopted. And there will be actually a formal presentation that will be made to the APS Council in, in April. And um, so we'll, we'll be presenting the report to Council and, and, you know, look for their support as well. So I think it looks pretty, pretty good that a number of the recommendations will be adopted. Um, yes, I just want to say uh, that, you know, it's the work of this committee has really been very important for APS, and clearly that's why we uh, formed it, because I wanted to hear from this community. I think the job of APS is creating uh, a wonderful atmosphere for everyone who wants to pursue physics, and we are committed to that. And um, so absolutely, I um, am delighted to, you know, have these recommendations come forward. I think it's great that they're going to be presented to the council because that's our elected governing body. And, uh, you know, we will continue to look at them in the various departments that, um, you know, they pertain to. I also wanted to mention the um, best practices guide that I have read um, and pretty thoroughly. So I think the question was, how do the experience of tr experiences of trans and gender non-conforming people compare? Do you want to? Or? Significantly worse almost across the board. Less comfortable environments, more experiences of harassment, more observation of harassment, more likely to leave, and also some of the most extreme cases of discrimination, physical harassment, which could actually be better described as abuse than anyone else in this document. If there's anything to be taken away from this report, it's that as a community, we really need to think about how we are including people who are trans and making sure that we have a better environment for those folks. For those of you online, I'm afraid we have to wrap it up. Thank you so much for attending our press conference. Uh, we will have additional press conferences that are on the schedule online.